Hi, everyone. So welcome to the Early Career Researcher Lightning Talk session. So every year, HCR UK wants to shine a spotlight on some of the work of early career researchers in the community. And this year is no exception. So I'm joined on stage by Patrick, Claudia, uh, Haley, Matthew, uh, Georgina, and Irem, all of whom are early career researchers coming from a really nicely diverse range of disciplines, roles, uh, research topics and geographies, and all of their research topics fit really nicely in with HDR UK's ethos. So they beat out quite a tough um, group of competitors to get to this stage. Um, there were uh, many more applications than there were speaking slots, um, decided by an independent panel. Um, and so let me congratulate them for getting this far. But their challenge today, and as any of you in this room who have presented research might understand that it really is a real challenge, is to present their work in less than four minutes. So it'll be, then it'll be over to you, the audience, to uh, vote for who you think was the best lightning talk of the session. Um, there'll be no uh, Q&A as part of this session, but please do um, grab the researchers and um, spark up any conversations or ideas you might have for them over the lunch break. Um, and with that, um, I want you to just our first speaker, Patrick Vidalka. Uh, so thanks very much for having me. Uh, my name is Patrick Vidalka, and I'm a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I'm also a PhD student. I'm submitting my PhD in three weeks. So it's very calm at the office. Um, so. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to be talking about type 2 diabetes uh, anti-diabetic treatments. So people who uh, have type 2 diabetes often start with metformin monotherapy to manage their blood glucose. And then when metformin isn't enough, they often or usually add uh, a second line treatment to metformin monotherapy. And there are three main alternatives in the UK. Um, and the problem is that there's still some clinical uncertainty as to which treatment is best for particular patients. And so what we end up seeing because of this clinical uncertainty is substantial variation in the proportion of people who are prescribed these treatments across groups of general practices in the UK or in England. And so each bar in this graph is a group of general practices, and you see that the proportion of people prescribed each treatment varies quite substantially. And so in this study design, uh, what we try and do is use this variation in an instrumental variable analysis to try and get as, at the treatment effect of these three alternative anti-diabetic treatments. And so you can think of it kind of like a randomized controlled trial, although it's not a randomized controlled trial. But instead of looking at the treatment people actually receive, you look at an instrument that's upstream of this treatment assignment. Um, and that is unrelated to the confounders that normally bias uh, our treatment effects in observational studies. And so here we're using that variation as the prescribing history of the group of the GPs um, to then estimate this treatment effect independent of measured and unmeasured confounders. And of course, we're making very strong assumptions in this analysis, uh, which I don't have time to go into today. And so I'm cutting straight to the results here. Um, but we had 75,000 people from UK primary and secondary care. We used clinical practice research data link uh, linked with hospital episode statistics. And we looked at a variety of outcomes that are important to patients with diabetes. And so uh, to just summarize this forest plot, we, fit, we did find that the newer type of drugs, sodium glucose co-transported 2 inhibitors, were better at reducing blood, blood sugar body mass index, and blood pressure compared to the alternatives. So we had good evidence of this. Um, sorry, these graphs are hard to read, and that's why I'm summarizing them in these tables. But when we look at cardiovascular and kidney outcomes and death, we observe sort of uh, less, less strong evidence um, in terms of these outcomes. We see that SGLT2I were better than the alternatives at preventing heart failure hospitalization. We saw some evidence that these drugs were better at prevent slowing the decline of kidney function. 
but we didn't see much evidence to suggest that they were better than the alternatives for other cardiovascular and kidney outcomes and all-cause mortality. So to very quickly conclude, um, using the instrumental variable analysis, we did get some insight into um, the comparative effectiveness of these drugs and seeing that SGLT2I were better than the alternatives for some treatment or for some outcomes among a general population of people with, anti -di or with diabetes. When we compare these results to other studies which use more traditional methods but assume no unobserved confounding and other study designs like placebo-controlled RCTs, we do see um, similar but less strong benefits of these drugs. And so this study design can be a useful complement to other study designs and randomized controlled trials using routinely collected health data to get at sort of understanding treatment effects and informing clinical practice. So just thank you everybody for your attention and thanks to my study team who um, I couldn't do the work without. My name is Claudia, I'm a new, from the University of Manchester, and I'd like to thank HDR UK for the opportunity to talk about our work on using artificial intelligence to improve the HIP surveillance for children with cerebral palsy. Why is this important? This, li this little boy here has got cerebral palsy, which is the most common physical disability in children. And having cerebral palsy, this means this little boy will have all kinds of health implications, one of which being that he's got a very high risk that his hip bone will dislocate. Now, if this happens, he will have severe pain, he will have problems sitting, and he also will require very complex, invasive, and costly surgery. Now, hip dislocation means that the hip bone has moved out, migrated out of the hip socket. And in children with cerebral palsy, this happens because abnormal muscle forces keep pulling on that bone. Now, if the doctors were able to identify early that a bone is moving out of the socket, they can, could then offer those children less complex, less invasive, and less costly treatments. So our goal is to enable all children with cerebral palsy to be regularly monitored for hip migration such that doctors can identify a migrating hip early and can provide timely treatment. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence actually recommends that those children have regular hip exercise image being taken and that they're monitored for hip migration. And the framework to achieve this is a national surveillance program called the Cerebral Palsy Integrated Pathway, or CPIPS. So that means that all the images taken as part of CPIPs, they need to be analyzed and the bones need to be measured because it's those measurements that help the doctors to identify how much change there has been compared to the last image. Now, in areas where CPIP is working well, this is really successful and it leads to improved patient outcome by identifying those migrating hips early. Unfortunately, though, in a lot of areas, there's a lack of capacity and resource to do this analysis because it's time consuming and the quality of it is affected by who is doing the analysis. So in some areas, there might be months between the image being taken and the image being analyzed. And because of that, there's a range of variation in the terms of quality of care that children with cerebral palsy get with regards to hip migration. So we've developed an artificial intelligence based system to automatically analyze these images. So our system will outline the bone of interest in the hip X-ray image, and it will then calculate what's called the rimus migration percentage, which is the key clinical measurement to assess hip migration. We've validated our system on a large clinical data set of 1,650 hip X-rays of children with cerebral palsy. And we do the analysis by comparing our automatic measurements to that of five clinical experts who have all manually measured the very same images. Now, in terms of results, we found that the variation amongst those five clinical experts was the same as the variation between our automatic system and the manual measurements. And also that when we look at the average difference between the automatic measurements and the manual measurements, 
that that was within the range of what would be expected if we were to ask a clinical expert to measure the same image twice. So overall, our results suggest that our system performs equally well to clinical experts. Our ultimate goal is to integrate our system into CPIP such that every image being taken is automatically measured. That data would then fit into the electronic health record for that patient to inform clinical care, but it will also feed into what might become the world's largest database of HIP measurements of children with cerebral palsy, informing important future research. So in conclusion, our system will help spot doctors to identify which children with cerebral palsy might have HIP problems. It will enable less complex, less invasive, less costly treatment. It will save doctors about 10 minutes analysis time per image. It will reduce measurement inconsistency by automating the process. And overall, our system will enable that every child with cerebral palsy will receive the same high quality of care. Thank you. If we're not counted, we do not count. A statement used by an LGBT Foundation report published in 2021 is one that really resonates with my research. The idea that we have groups in society we know little about and whose data we don't have and feel they don't count. This is particularly the case in the design and delivery of healthcare services. We have very little data on sexual orientation. And so we have groups that don't, um, that we have groups that don't think that they don't count. And so my mixed methods PhD research um, has looked at aiming to understand uh, access to mental health services for sexual minority groups. Um, my initially, my systematic mapping review looked at uh, existing evidence of inequalities in access and found that there was very little, ex uh, very little evidence on access to um, mental health services for um, sexual minority groups. I wanted to rectify this by working with a local NHS trust um, to look at their data to see whether there was any sexual orientation data that we could look at um, to understand access to sexual minority groups. I gained access to four and a half years worth of data um, from two adult mental health services, improving access to psychological therapies, also known as IUP services, and community mental health teams, um, also known as CMHTs to understand whether we could see, whether that we can understand access to mental health services for sexual minority groups. So I looked at representation of sexual minority groups across the data sets and compared that with Census 21 um, data, finding that there are, um, sexual minority groups are um, accessing mental health services um, with more, um, almost double the representation um, compared with the data we've got for census population. However, we can't make any um, assumptions about the size of mental health need for these groups. I then looked at the extent of missing data um, sex for sexual orientation across the um, data sets um, to assess um, whether we can look at predictors of missingness, are certain things associated with missing sexual orientation data. Um, and we found that missing sexual orientation is quite prevalent across the um, data sets but also that it's associated with various different service and service user characteristics, such as age, ethnicity, deprivation, and referral source, indicating that there is something we could do about addressing those um, data recording practices. Patterns of access over time differ by sexual orientation um, and also by services. So particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Referrals to IUP services um, increased for sexual minority groups, whereas they decreased for CMHT services during the pandemic when compared with heterosexual groups. And contacts, um, for non-attendance for contacts with mental health services um, doesn't appear to differ by sexual orientation. And I'm just looking at um, doing some regression analysis at the moment to see whether there are other predictors of non-attendance in the data set. So I draw your attention to this so to highlight that we can use this data to look at groups and consider um, addressing the missingness um, 
and considering the new service, service user themselves. So I'm currently conducting semi-structured interviews for LG, with LGBTQ plus people about their experiences of mental health services. And there's just a few quotes there um, around um, their perspectives of mental health services and their use um, and their experiences of disclosing their sexual orientation. I've also embedded um, patient and public involvement and um, stakeholder engagement in my PhD um, from the outset to embed their perspectives into the design of the research, but also interpret the findings. My hope is that this research can illustrate that you can, that we should collect more data for these groups so that sexual minority groups feel that they are counted and that they no longer feel like they don't count. Thank you. So, hello, I'm Matthew Watson from Durham University, and I'm going to talk a bit about a chemotherapy risk stratification model and how we've taken it from FEV to being used in practice. So, for those of you who aren't aware, chemotherapy is given in cycles. This cycle consists of a blood test, which, amongst other things, looks at your kidney and liver function to make sure you're well enough to continue with treatment. If you are well enough, you're given your next dose of chemotherapy and then you have a couple of weeks to rest before the cycle starts again. Now, these blood tests are a real block for patients. They mean you have to go into clinic to have the blood test taken. They put a lot of strain on phlebotomy services to get the results in. And quite often, the blood tests are delayed, which results in your treatment being delayed, which is linked to worse outcomes. And we know that actually only around 10% of chemotherapy patients have any dysfunction that's picked up by these blood tests. So maybe we can use some sort of machine learning uh, instead. So that's what we did. And on a small data set from a single hospital, we trained and validated a machine learning model that took in your demographics and some blood test results from your previous two cycles of treatment to stratify you into a high risk or low risk group. The idea being that if you're predicted high risk, you have the blood test as normal. If you're predicted low risk, it's not quite as important to get that blood test result in before you continue with treatment. We knew this worked on data from one hospital. So we went to some clinicians and said, what do you need from us to be able to use it in practice? And we've got two main themes. One, it needs to be very well validated. And two, it needs to be easy to use. So we extended our validation to three different hospitals in the UK, each with very different patient populations. Um, and this is the important bit, because if your model isn't trained on distinct, very distinct patient populations, when it's deployed in practice, it might not work as well as you expect. And so this is a bit of a complex slide, but just very quickly, higher is better. The blue bar is a model trained on data from two hospitals, whereas the orange bar was only trained on data from hospital one and the green bar was only trained on data from hospital three. And in general, what you see is that the blue bar, which was trained on data from multiple hospitals, performs well on data from multiple hospitals, whereas models trained on data from only one hospital tends to only work on data from that hospital. So now we have a well-validated model. What about the ease of use bit? Well, originally, on the left, we had a model which takes in a lot of complex data, and it was difficult for clinicians to input it into the model. So we simplified this, made it easier to use, and that's the results we have on the right. And as you can see, performance is pretty consistent, um, and in some cases, even better than the more complex model. At the same time, we looked at the bias of the model. So we evaluated uh, performance across different patient subgroups. So does it perform better on males versus females, for example, or older people versus young people? And in general, you see that it's fairly well balanced and not massively biased towards a significant population. So now we have clinician buy-in. What about patients? Are they happy with it being used? Well, actually, in general, when we talk to chemotherapy patients, yes, they are, as long as your clinicians are happy. What we got from patients is that there's actually a massive information overload for them. And they're given a lot of information that maybe isn't a always relevant to them. So we actually changed some of our project to develop a patient-facing app 
which can uh, provide patient-specific, cancer-specific information for them. And I'll leave you with a couple of conclusions, and that's my time. My name's Georgina Ireland, um, and I'm going to talk you through our project where we've linked family court data on public uh, law proceedings to health data in England. So what are public law family court proceedings? These are cases where children's social services uh, believe the child's at risk of maltreatment or serious harm, and in these cases they may go to court or to intervene, and this can end up in the children being removed from the family home. So we've taken this data on the mothers specifically and linked them to hospital data and the admissions associated with the delivery of children. And this has enabled us to create a cohort of uh, 3.1 million mothers in England who have delivered their first child from 2007 onwards and we were able to follow them up over their parenting and childbearing years and see how many um, end up in court proceedings within 10 years. So we've identified... The first, this slide is um, looking at the profile of mothers um, who have been involved in care proceedings within 10 years and what they look like at the delivery of their child. And we see that they're more deprived and they're younger at first delivery than women who were not involved in court proceedings. So 79% of the women who were involved in court proceedings were aged under 25 at first delivery compared to 30% of women who were not. And 72% of women were living in the two most deprived quintiles um, in comparison to 50% uh, of other women. Not only this, but we can look at their health profiles before delivery, and we see that the women who are involved in care proceedings um, have much higher prevalence of, of chronic health conditions, intellectual or multiple disability, mental health and adversity related injuries. And these are using their hospital admissions in the three years prior to their first child. Um, and adversity related injury admissions are associated with drug and alcohol use, self-harm and violence. So using this cohort, we've then looked at them for the first 10 years, an estimated cumulative incidence of care proceedings with Kaplan-Meier analysis. Um, and, we, and the chart is showing the pre cumulative prevalence by um, 10 years for each of the social and demographic uh, indicators. And overall, we see that 1.3% of women were involved in care proceedings within 10 years of their first child. But unsurprisingly, from the previous slide, we're seeing much higher prevalence um, for teenage mothers and women who are um, living in the most appropriate areas of England. And not only that, when we look at their health burden at, um, prior, at first child, we see this stark difference by um, health profiles. So almost 23% of women with an intellectual or multiple disability will be involved in care proceedings within 10 years. That's 5.7% if they had an admission associated with mental health um, diagnosis, and 13% if they were, had an admission associated with adversity-related injury. Now, we think the take-home messages from this is that by profiling women and using this information at first birth, we can target services at the most vulnerable women at the start of their parenting journey. And this doesn't have to just in, uh, involve their health. It could also be looking at parenting classes, help getting back into education and training, and those wider social um, and social uh, factors. Um, we also, this is the first time we've linked this data in England. Um, and so this is the start of our analysis journey. And we are hoping that um, by digging more into the profiles and the birth trajectories and the mortality different, and we're going to be looking at mortality in these women, we're hoping that over the coming years we'll be able to better target services and help these families involved uh, in care proceedings, and this will improve the health outcomes not only of the mother but also of their children. Uh, thank you. And Hi, I'm Iram. I'm data engineer at the uh, University of Dundee, and today I'll be talking about uh, mapping the Sto Scottish population health scale data to OMOP to support fair data principles. 
So we are aware that data saves lives, but the biggest obstacle in achieving this is uh, the inability of the researchers to uh, easily find and access uh, the data that fits their research needs. Um, as we know that the volume of the data is increasing, we need to be mindful that we create this data with longevity in mind, and uh, the researchers are able to reuse this data. This way we would be able to use the data to its true potential, and also we'll be able to generate uh, quick feasibility studies um, uh, and timely research outputs without duplicating the effort of recollecting the data or wasting time in finding where it exists. Fair data principles explain how the data and the outputs could be represented and organized such that the data is findable, accessible, understandable, and um, exchangeable and reusable. So we know that uh, the data could be present in uh, variable formats, in silos, um, and in different structures, and there could be da various data governance issues which could make it difficult for the researcher to find and access the data. Um, so we are trying to transform this data into a um, uniform, uh, standard, uh, common data model, which is called OMOP, which you've heard before. So it's called uh, Observational Model Outcomes Partnership, which was developed by Odyssey, Observational Health, uh, Data Science, and Informatics. The main concept of OMOP is to transform all the data sets to a standard schema, terminologies, units, and measurements. Uh, this has enabled us to, um, so in Public Health Scotland um, is also actively participating in transforming their data to OMOP, and this has uh, allowed Public Health Scotland to collaborate with HDR and their COVID-19 project called CoConnect, where they uh, publish their metadata on uh, the Health Data uh, Research UK Innovation Gateway, and their uh, OMOP transform data sets are available on the cohort discovery tool. This tool allows the researchers to um, so query their research questions in a federated fashion on uh, variable data sets because they are standardized. Also, Odyssey um, and Eden collaborated to create a, a multinational uh, study uh, which involved 26 databases across 11 countries. Health Informa uh, Informatics Center was also part of it, including data from NHS, um, Tayside, and Fife. And um, the database included uh, data of 24 patients. The aim of the study was to <coughs> find the incident rates um, involving um, COVID vaccinations, um, uh, around the uh, AESIs and compared them with the, uh, with the patient's um, population of uh, pre-COVID uh, levels. Uh, the only way this uh, huge large-scale study was uh, possible was because um, the analytical code was shared across and the data was transformed to OMOP, so it was fairly easy to do this study in a shorter time across uh, 11 countries and 26 databases. Uh, so we, uh, during the CoConnect uh, Co project, we uh, developed tools which are called Carrot tools, uh, which will uh, enable the OMOP transformation. The main idea behind this was to standardize the uh, process of transformation um, and to ensure that um, the organizations can transform their data with minimal OMOP um, uh, knowledge. So we are trying to make sure that the data mapping uh, exists outside the data transformation so the organizations can use external help uh, who can map their data. And since the mapping process does not include any real data and it's based on the metadata of the data, um, uh, they can easily reuse the mapping rules and they can exchange the mapping rules uh, across different organizations. So as discussed earlier, OMOP could be labor intensive, but using our tools, um, it has a very low learning curve. And even if you're not familiar with OMOP, you can still transform by using um, external expertise who can map your data and you can transform in your secure network um, without giving your data away. And these are some of the results of the COVID data that we have transformed in Public Health Scotland. I'm over time, so thank you. <laughs>